All right, well, I guess I'm going to start. Um, so, I've been asked to give a few lectures on astrophysics in Antarctica, and that's why the title says Astrophysics in Antarctica. Um, my name is written there. <coughs> um, I'm from Lawrence, Kansas, uh, and for those of you who are familiar with it, uh, Kansas represents the place where Dorothy grew up, and it's also famous for tornadoes. And I'll mention that I was here um, a long time ago, uh, many years ago, uh, maybe 30, not quite 30, 25 years ago. And it was my first time in Russia, and I thought that Novosibirsk must be as far away from Kansas as I could possibly imagine. And Novosibirsk, to me, represented somehow another planet. And it was a totally different place. And I flew into the airport, and there was a driver that picked me up and took me to your very nice hotel, Solataya Galina. And I had been flying, of course, all night, so I was pretty tired. And I got out of the car, and I looked down, and on the ground, on the cement, on the sidewalk, in front of the Zolotai Galina, someone had written Kansas Rocks. <laughs> And I somehow knew that they were not talking about the entire state of Kansas. What they were talking about was this very god-awful band, These group, this group of musicians who came from Lawrence, Kansas, who put out some musical hits in the 80s and 90s, and evidently became so famous that somebody who, for whatever misguided reason, liked them, decided to write down Kansas Rocks on the, on the sidewalk in front of the, the hotel. So, so let's see, yeah, so I'm going to, I'm going to be talking about, in general, the format of this will be will be very non-technical. Um, this is a set of slides that I put together for some students who are evidently younger than yourselves, not as advanced. And because of that, um, the level will probably be uh, somewhat, somewhat lower. Um, and I'll ask for your indulgence with that. The, um, the emphasis will be on, I'll give you some introduction and some history, um, and of course science, um, and the emphasis will be on detection techniques. And if you want to detect, so what we're doing is we're detecting cosmic ray particles in Antarctica, and what are the techniques that you might use? Well, one technique is to find a very patient graduate student. And here is an example of a very patient graduate student. I left him there uh, around 1995. And, and he's probably still waiting for something to happen. Um, you can't see it off screen. There was a stack of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for him to eat. Now, my, I have a little bit of a concern, um, and that is vis-a-vis the uh, language. So I want to, of course, it doesn't do any good if I'm not, I'm not being understood. So what I'm going to do to make sure that I'm being understood is that as we go along, I'm going to give you problems to work on. 
and these are problems so that I can make sure that you're following what I'm saying. Okay? Okay. So, and if, ne if needed, um, possibly we can clarify some points in Russian. It's made difficult by the fact that I don't speak any Russian. Um, speak a little bit, but with your help, I can possibly try. Okay, so this is this is one way of catching cosmic rays in in Antarctica. Okay, before I start, everyone knows what this is a picture of. We we see is not to show it. Right, cosmic microwave background. Okay, and you're all familiar with the. Um, with the experimental result um, that the uh, that the B to E ratio is was was, um, was announced at 0 0.2 last year. You're all familiar with that. This bicep result. It means that one which would then to conclude to both the existence of gravitational waves. Yes. Okay, so every, everybody's familiar with that. We, Everybody knows that, is that right? We 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 see see my comment said that by by septic. Much big top than this one. Okay. Well, okay, we'll we'll talk a little bit about it. So there's probably much big place to get the new Rasbros um Znakomstva said. So we'll talk a little bit about this um in the next couple of days. Okay, so as I said before, to ensure that I'm being understood, um, I'm going to ask you to work out some problems every so often. Okay? Так что я могу быть уверен, что все, которые я скажу, будет понятно. Я буду просто вам сделать какие-то, ну, маленькие задачи. Okay? So connectivity. I don't know what the I don't know the translation is. Um, in English it means the same thing as in Russian. You can have a sednyenya, um, which is an electrical sednyenya. And this is a picture of uh, myself and my friend uh, Jiwoo from South Korea, and when this picture was taken, we were at a place which was about uh, 200 kilometers from the nearest civilization, and our Sajnyanya, our connectivity was broken because of the fact that our generator was broken. Uh, and this is a problem that probably in Nova Sibiris you're familiar with, um, that the carburetor in very cold weather uh, accumulates um, little ice droplets. So, um, this was our exercise in trying to maintain connectivity, um, and as I said before, I'm going to give you problems to maintain connectivity with you in the course of the next couple of days. Okay, so here are some of the experiments that I'll talk about. So all of these little circles represent some experiment that I am that I work on. Um, the yellow circle here um, is a circle which represents an experiment that measures cosmic rays through radio wave emissions. And I'll, I'll talk about that also. Um, the blue dots are all experiments which measure ultra high energy neutrinos through also through 
the emission of radio waves. So this is um, this is an experiment called ARA at the South Pole, which stands for Ascaria Radio Array. This is an experiment called Ariana on the Ross Ice Shelf. Um, this is an experiment that we did, shown in the previous slide, um, at a place called Taylor Dome. Um, we did some work at your very famous station, Vostok. And um, again, most of our work goes on at the, at the South Pole. So this is all a technique uh, which is based on the idea of detecting ultra-high energy neutrinos through their radio wave emissions. Now, there's another experiment, which you're probably familiar with, which is called the Ice Cube Experiment, and with which I also, on which I also work. And Ice Cube detects ultra-high energy neutrinos through measurements not of radio waves, but of uh, optical Cherenkov radiation. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> there are two experiments um, located at the, basically located at the South Pole, and I'll talk a little bit about the relative advantages of each, each approach. Now, in addition, yeah, in addition, there is a, uh, there's also a, an additional experiment on which I work, which is a balloon-based experiment. So there's a balloon, and the balloon, under the balloon, there's a, uh, a gondola, and the gondola consists of a set of radio wave uh, receivers, which again is scanning, is scanning the ice. Okay, now, since the, since the technique, there's one technique which is common to all these experiments, I'm going to, as your first problem, I'm going to ask you to compare the sensitivity of a radio wave detector experiment to a optical detector experiment. So, um, okay, so let's imagine, so I'm going to sketch out what the what the scheme is, and what we're looking for are so-called, the source of particles that we're looking for are so-called cosmic neutrinos. This is this term at the at the at the znakom come on cosmogenic cosmogenic chiski neutrino da you know what that means the principle sorry you you familiar with this I'm not sure not sure okay so right it's a it's obvious in principle but there's a specific process so there's a relationship is the kind of atmosphere между космогенические нейтрины и то же, как называется cheesy shape. Это отношение знакомых вам. Кусьян, да? Или нет? Может быть нет. Окей. Вы знакомы с GZK Cutoff? Yes. GZK. Сеть, да? Нет. Нет, окей. Хорошо. Лучше знать нет. Поэтому я буду, как сказать, объяснить, откуда это происходит. So, the... So, for now, I'll just say that we're looking for very high energy neutrinos. And I'll mention that it's connected with this so-called GCK cutoff. And maybe tomorrow we'll talk a little bit more about the connection between these two.
But for now, I'll just remind you that the detection of neutrinos up till at least the last year was very limited. So remember that in the 1950s, there was this uh, guy, um, Ray Davis, in America. Which I always thought was funny because there's also a very famous Ray Davies. He's not to go Ray Davies. Ray Davies. Fuchs, 
They became very interested in Ponte Corvo because they thought that Ponte Corvo was also a spy. So they were very close to arresting Ponte Corvo. Ponte Corvo realized that he was being, as we say in America, trailed. How do you say it? Um, so he climbed into the um, trunk of a car and he crossed the Finnish border into, um, into the Soviet Union. So he, went, so he, um, he escaped uh, from Kruzovka, Kruzovka, Machina. Um, what Finland go? And Ponte Corvo was the person, of course, who came up with the idea that neutrinos can have different flavors. So one way of explaining this deficit is by saying that neutrinos were changing their flavor as they went from the sun to the earth. And this idea of neutrino mixing and flavor changing was in fact later, later demonstrated. Um, the next big landmark in um, neutrino astronomy was supernova 1987A, probably no. So this was a very famous supernova where there were underground experiments um, in the US, for instance, which were not designed to detect neutrinos. They were designed to detect the decay of protons. And at that time, people believed that protons decayed because there was this grand unified theory, SU5, so SU5 was a grand unified theory that was going to solve all of physics. And one of the predictions of SU5 was that supernovas decay. Uh, sorry, sorry, was that protons decay. So there were experiments. The experiments were designed to measure the decay products of protons. What instead they measured is one evening what they measured was a flash of activity in their detectors which preceded a supernova flash by some matter of seconds, 20 seconds or 30 seconds. So these experiments detected somewhere between 10 to 15 neutrinos and then 10 to 15 seconds later they saw there was a photon splash that came from the explosion of the supernova. Now, why is it that the neutrino flash preceded the photons? Зачем нептрин был наблюден, над наблюдено перед тем, как было наблюдено фотоны? Знаете, мы уже что кто то знает. Well, what's let me ask you another question. How long does it take? How long does it take for a photon inside the sun? Just say, here's the sun. How long does it take for a photon inside the sun to emerge out of the sun? You know? Do you know? How long? No, no, it's measured in thousands of years. Ah, you mean from, from the sun, yeah? Yeah, from the center of the sun. Yeah. The of the sun. And from this uh, supernova explosion, it's... Well, from the supernova explosion, all the photons were just thrown out. When is this uh, shockwave reached the surface, yes? When the shockwave reached the surface, yeah. But the neutrinos uh, uh, escapes immediately. They escape immediately, of course, right. So, so the mean free path for photons 
inside these stars is, is very, inside these stars are very small. The neutrinos escaped immediately, whereas the photons bounced around many times before they actually escaped. So there was a neutrino flash, and then there was visible light. And then, of course, in sometime around uh, 19, 1990s, maybe 95, the Super Kamio Kande experiment actually verified neutrino flavorings. Okay? Um, they actually measured neutrino oscillations by looking at the difference in the flux going through the Earth as well as coming directly towards them. But these were all so-called atmospheric neutrinos. So, to put things in perspective, these neutrinos are from a supernova, obviously. These neutrinos are coming from interactions in the atmosphere, which produce secondary neutrinos, so-called atmospheric neutrinos. And um, these neutrinos are all solar neutrinos. So up until two or three years ago, the only neutrinos that had been observed were either not, from, not coming from the atmosphere, were either neutrinos from, uh, neutrinos from the sun or from the supernova. Last year, for the first time, this ice cube experiment at the South Pole actually measured neutrinos coming from outside the solar system. So that was, that was, that was a big deal. All right, so there are experiments which can measure neutrinos from uh, using photomultiplier tubes. And as I said before, what we're mostly concerned with are neutrinos that come from that come from, or sorry, our radio waves that come from neutrinos. So how does that work? That works in the following way. So you suppose that there's a neutrino that comes from very far away. It interacts with, for instance, an ice molecule. And what happens, of course, is that there's a there's a charged current or a weak current interaction that follows. And as the and what that leads to is a shower inside the ice. This is a Lieben. Lieben. And as the shower develops, so for instance, here's Antarctica. Here's the ice. Here's a nucleon inside the ice, and here's a neutrino. The neutrino interacts with the nucleon, so we get nu and goes to some like proton uh, plus electron. Okay, now the electron will subsequently interact with an atomic, with an atom, an atom inside the ice, and will burn strong. And then this photon will subsequently pair produce. And this electron will again run strong. And you can see how this whole thing goes. So as time goes on, we will develop a we develop secondary particles, E minus gamma, E plus gamma. And the way, I've, the way I've sketched things out here, we get roughly an equal number of electrons and positrons and photons. However, in reality, inside the ice, there are the, all these particles can interact with electrons already inside the atoms in the ice. So what that means is that, so I'll imagine that I have, so here's, here's a little oxygen 
nucleus of H2O. And here's an oxygen nucleus. Of all these electrons. And I'll call these atomic electrons. And each one of these positrons can, in principle, annihilate. So it can have Baba annihilation. So I can have each one of these positrons can annihilate with a, an atomic electron. So because of that, because of annihilation, I will deplete, I start losing positrons. Okay, in addition, I can have, um, I can have scattering of photons, I can have Compton scattering of photons on these existing atomic electrons also. So as a result, as the shower propagates forward, two things will happen. I'm going to deplete the number of positrons, and I'm going to enhance the number of electrons through the immediate equivalent of ionization. So overall, the shower will acquire a net negative charge. So this, the shower acquires a net negative charge because of Compton scattering of atomic electrons into the forward moving shower and annihilation of positrons also with atomic electrons. Okay? Okay. And that's all listed here. So what the picture looks like is the following. Here's my neutrino. And then I have the shower that develops. And as you know, for an electromagnetic shower, the transverse dimension is defined by the Molière radius. And each one of the particles in this shower will radiate Cherenko radiation. Okay, now, your problem is the following. What I want to know is numerically, I have two choices. Numerically, at what energy of the neutrino, is it better to detect this shower using radio waves than photomultiplier tubes? Why can't I just observe this shower with photomultiplier tubes? I have two possibilities. One possibility is to take a PMT, a hat U, as you say. And I can just observe the shower with my photomultiplier tube. Alternately, I can instead I can put a radio wave antenna in the ice, and I can look at the Cherenkov emissions coming from the shower in radio waves. Why is one better than the other? What are the considerations? The considerations are. First of all, okay, so the information that you'll need to solve this is the following. The first thing is that, as I told you before, there's a charge excess of electrons over positrons. Okay? electron, not positron. And that excess We'll say it's about equal to the energy of the neutrino. So for every one n one MeV neutrino, this isn't exactly right, but it turns out this is the right answer in this one. So I can't that. So for every one for, for a neutrino of energy MeV, we get we'll say we get one electron and zero positrons. Okay? That's the first piece of information. The second piece of information that you need 
is the following. If I look at this shower, each one of the particles, so we'll now only concern ourselves with the excess electron. So we'll say that we'll call this number n. Next. Now each one of these excess electrons is radiating Cherenkov radiation. So here's an electron. And it's radiating Cherenkov radiation. And Cherenkov radiation, in principle, is broadband, which means that there are some photons that are emitted at high frequency and some photons that are emitted at low frequency. What's the energy of each of those photons? Well, the energy, of course, of each photon is just equal to h bar omega. So, clearly, if I have just one electron, I want to use a photomultiplier tube because a photomultiplier tube is sensitive to a higher frequency. But that's not what I have. What I have is lots of electrons, and they're all radiating Cherenkov radiation. So, because of that, if I look at each one of these if I look at the Cherenkov radiation coming from each of these particles, there are two limits. One limit is lambda much less than the Molière radius. So if I look, if my detector is sensitive to a wavelength which is much smaller than the wavelength, Molière radius, then there's no phase relationship from one electron to the next. The phase relationship is entirely random. If, however, I look at long wavelengths, such as what my radio receiver is sensitive to, now all of the radiation, all of the phases line up. Okay? So, if I look, so if lambda is much less than R Molière, the phase addition is incoherent. And if lambda is much greater than R Molière, then our mind that R Molière is about 10 centimeters then the phase addition is coherent. Okay, so given, given this, and if I tell you that Photomultiplier tube. So our photomultiplier tube, we'll say, is sensitive at uh, 500 nanometers. And let's say our radio receiver operates at 600 megahertz. What I, want, what I want you to do is to find the energy at which the coherent addition of radio signals exceeds the incoherent addition of optical signals. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat it. Я хочу, чтобы вы можете вычислить тот энергия дептрин, так что Кохерентная, как сказать, кохерентная сумма в диапазон радиоволны будет выше, чем некохерентная сумма при оптический диапазон. Окей? And this is what you know for each. 
power. For a coherent addition, obviously the total power is just n times this number. What is it for an incoherent addition? There's a word for it in English. There's a word for it in Russian. Must be best of that. Случайно, заблуждение, случайно. Как? Проби, проби. Как сказать? What's the English? Random walk. Свободный пробег. Okay. So it's the same problem. For a свободный пробег, if I start here and I take n steps. and each step has length L, how far am I from the starting point? Square. Sorry? Square. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Do you understand the problem? So I'm actually asking you to calculate a number here. And while you're doing that, I'm going to circulate another piece of paper. And what I want you to do is I want you to write out the, the percent of scope percent in your Okay? Hundred percent, fifty percent, thirty percent. Okay? This is very important. How of what you uh tell them how much how, how much do we understand you mean or what? Yeah. Понятно. Я, я хочу, чтобы вы, вы, вы должны написать сколько процентов, то, что я только что сказал, вам понятно. Окей? Okay? Окей, okay, so the, so the key here is after n как то легко будет этот человек? Вы знаете, как сказать uh, so, so body uh, okay. uh, square root. I think it's squared. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. So, what we have is the following. So, for each for each photon. For each photon, the energy of a radio photon is equal to uh, h bar, let's just say hf. And for, for hc over lambda, let's see. and for e optical. Uh, the energy is also equal to HC over lambda. Here, the wavelength of my 500 megahertz, I said 500, 600 megahertz, 600 megahertz radio wave is, is equal to HC over um, 0 0.5 meters. So the wavelength is half a meter. And here for optical, this is equal to HC over uh, 500, or 500 to the minus 7. Okay? The total, the total energy total energy in radio waves is equal to what? Well, it's a coherent sum. So it's so for each of these, so I just have to add each of these coherently. So the total energy in radio is just N HC over 0 0.5 meters. Total energy in optical. is equal to n, a uh, root n, times hc all over 
five times ten to the seventh minus seven meters. Okay, and I want this number to be bigger than that number. So the total power in radio is greater than the total power in optical. It's, it's wrong, why is it wrong? Uh, you want this to be n squared? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It should be n. Okay, so I, I take the, I take this, I take this ratio, I want this ratio to be greater than that ratio. And that tells me that the value of n. 10 to the 6th power. Right, so n must be greater than 10 to the 6th. So for n greater than 10 to the 6th, I have more power, more coherent power in radio waves than incoherent power in optical. Now we go back and E. Oh, It should be GEB, sorry. So that tells me that the energy, or energy for which energy neutrino greater than 10 to the 15th electron volts, the signal in radio, the coherent signal in radio, exceeds the incoherent signal in optical. Okay, and that is the basis of all, basically all the experiments that I work on. And that's the basis of what's called radio coherence. And there are many experiments now that are, that are trying to do this. But that's, that's the basic argument. So all the experiments, most of the experiments I'm going to talk about are based on that technique. Okay? All right. So that's, um, that's a lot of, a lot of history of my own experimentation. Uh, and one experiment which uses this technique is the so-called the so-called Anita experiment. And the Anita experiment consists of a so this is what the experiment looks like. So this is um, this thing hangs from a balloon it consists of a set of, these are radio wave antennas that are sensitive in the frequency range of 200 megahertz up to 1,000 megahertz. The whole thing is solar powered. And um, the total mass of this thing is about 500 to 600 kilograms or so. And the idea is that every winter, Every winter uh, in Antarctica, there is a very special wind that sets up, which is called the circumpolar wind. So every winter, there's a wind pattern called the vortex that drives around the center of the continent. And because of that, you can launch a balloon at the main base in McMurdo, and it just flies in a circle, which is good because if it drifted out over the sea, you couldn't cut it down and retrieve the data. Here, if it flies over soft snow, you can cut it down and it will land in a soft place. You can retrieve all, all the data. So this is the experiment that we have. This is another diagram of what we just, we just went through. Uh, let's see, here's the gondola itself, and this is what an event picture looks like. So, what the, the way this experiment works is through a technique which is very familiar to radio astronomers, which is called interferometry. And I'll talk more about this maybe next time. And what you do is you can measure the intensity of radio wave radiation coming at you from any point in the, on the surface. 
And this is one of the event pictures. So the, these antennas have the ability to measure both horizontally polarized radiation as well as vertically polarized radiation. And this is an example of one of the events that we measured. So if you imagine that the balloon is sitting up, is flying around at an elevation of 38 kilometers, and it's looking out, this is the so-called uh, horizon. Of course, the horizon is not at zero degrees because the Earth is curved, so the horizon is actually at minus six degrees. And what we saw was a source that was below the horizon, that is to say, something that looks like it's coming from the surface. Well, that's good because that's what neutrinos would look like. However, um, and I won't draw it for you here, but if you imagine, you can sort of imagine this, as you know, Cherenkov radiation has a very specific polarization. So, the Cherenkov polarization is such that the, the polarization vector is perpendicular to the, the K vector. And because of that, you expect neutrinos interacting in ice to be predominantly vertically polarized. Because of the way that they exit through the, through the, um, so when, when the signal, of course, refracts at the surface, this whole thing turns over and you get something that looks like this. So the signal should primarily be vertically polarized. Instead, what we saw was something that was a mixture of uh, horizontal polarization and vertical polarization, and in fact was not due to neutrinos, it was due instead to ultra-high-energy cosmic rays, which were producing showers in the atmosphere, and these showers were reflecting back up to the immutable moon. So we were really actually observing radio emissions that were coming from um, ultra-high-energy cosmic rays. Well, it was a pretty big deal at the time, because this was the first time anybody had actually observed this sort of a process. There is an experiment, for instance, the Pierre Auger experiment in Argentina, which is a $150 million experiment. And our, at least, our sensitivity, at least while the moon was up in the air, for this little $5 million experiment was about equal to Pierre Auger. Of course, Pierre Auger is, you know, they have a much longer lifetime than we can. Um, but it was, it was sort of a big deal. Okay, and this is, so this is the, the putative flight path that, um, that such, a, such an experiment would follow. So again, these are, these are sort of the event pictures that we make through, the, through, this, um, through this process called beam forming, which is very familiar to radio astronomers. Okay, um, all right, we'll go through here. All right, um, so one thing that I'll mention, if you're ever interested in doing Antarctic science, um, there is a reward for those of you who might be interested. So what happened is that because since I guess because I had been to the because I had been to Antarctica so many times, the U.S. Geological Service. We have this thing called the U.S. Geological Service, and their job is to give names to all sorts of places on the planet. And since America owns Antarctica, <laughs> well. I don't know how they decided to do this. Maybe this is some international agreement. But, of course, in principle, Antarctica is international. Nevertheless, 
our U.S. Geological Service decided that they had the right to start naming places in Antarctica. And in fact, because, I guess because I had been to Antarctica so many times, they decided to name a place in Antarctica after me. And this place is called the Besson Spur. Now, probably you don't know what a spur is, but a spur is also known as a crag in English. And I don't know what the word is in Russian. How do you say crag in Russian? Crag or spur? No, it's not quite a common, который, no. No, it's, it's some sort of rock which, uh, uh, which sticks out. So it's like, if you look at the side of, um, imagine you're looking at the side of a cliff or a mountain, and there's this rock that sticks out here. There must be a word for this rock. How do you say it protrude in Russian? What's it called? Kuchos. 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 I was on another week quite a slow. Um, well, <laughs> sorry, yes, okay. The sound of the is Mesta van der Tidia. That's why it's a Besson spur. The town is kind of Bolshoi common. And at first, oh, it says, actually down here it says Besson spur is a slope in there, but Besson spur is called the Sklon van der Tidia. Um, but the most important thing, some of you love that, is that um, if you go to this website, if you look up here, you see there's a possibility for hotels. And in that way, my uh, my name is Naushni Sladavania, Budushin. So, if you go to Antarctica enough, you'll have some feature, some piece of land named after you that unfortunately, so, um, this is probably where I can, I can retire here. Uh, okay. All right. Um, all right. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step back for a second and just say a little bit about the history of Antarctica. Probably, you're familiar with a lot of this. It's not very scientific, but some of this is such good press that I'm going to tell you anyway. So, um, let's see. Oh, Captain Cook circumnavigates the Antarctic continent in 1772. Probably you know what happened to Captain Cook. If anyone's not to push the chills, then that's what he's doing. He's doing this is a map that shows Antarctica circa 1800. Um, Bellinghausen, who I guess was flying, Bellinghausen's ship uh, was flying the Russian flag, but he himself was, I guess, of German descent. He circumnavigates Antarctica and actually uh, sees snow. Um, and then, you know, there was this, um, there was this sudden, let's see, in English it's called the Era of Discovery. 
So there was this time around the turn of the century where people decided they wanted to conquer the, the Poles. And um, this guy, Robert Falcon Scott, with whom you're probably familiar, um, it was his life plan to be the first person to get to the South Pole. And he made a little base, and that base is still, you can, you can walk into his, into his little, his little head. That's the point, Mr. Chess, when you show such a fluid. Um, and then the first real opportunity, the first real chance to actually get to the South Pole, the person that came closest, was Ernest Shackleton. Um, and he got, to put it in perspective, he was within the diameter of Moscow. The diameter of Moscow separated himself, his closest point, from the actual South Pole, and then he turned back. Well, he was running out of running out of food. Okay. Um, and then, of course, in 1911, the finally Roald Amundsen, the Norwegian, um, arrives at the South Pole. And then um, a year later, uh, yeah, sorry, a month later, uh, Scott. This is Scott. And even the picture, even the even these pictures sort of portray the difference in their styles. Možno je to skrz vašu šat. Raznici, raznici mešto je tými ľudmi od ich kartiky. So Scott was British. And I don't know if that sentence has the same impact or meaning for you as it does for us in America. But when you say that someone is British, with a capital B, someone who's British. That means that someone is in the tradition of Henry V, or Henry IV. So I have, I have these two, two, uh, I have two girls at home, please uh, see them yet. And um, whenever we, um, whenever we go somewhere, um, I, or if we're going to jump into a pool, for instance, I utter these, this very famous stanza, which is British. And it comes from when I was a, when I was a graduate student. I had a British friend, and the other one is is on about Cambridge, and um, we ran together. And at the end of our run, and as we approached this hill, he would recite to himself this passage from Henry IV. Um, so you know the, the Shakespeare play, uh, Henry IV. So Henry IV is about to fight the French army at Avoncourt. The French army has four times as many soldiers, and Henry IV rallies his soldiers with this very stirring speech that goes, and I'll recite it to you in English because I don't know it in Russian, but Every time you're running, my friend Martin, the English, my English friend, would recite this as we're running towards this hill. He would say, into the breach once more, dear friends, into the breach once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In times of peace, nothing becomes man so much as modest stillness and humility, but when the blast of war rages in our ears, imitate the actions of this tiger. Stiffen the sinews, disguise their nature with hard favored rage, and God for Harry, England, and St. George. And then my friend Martin would start running. Run up this hill. And that was that was British. It was, you know, that was in the tradition of great British heroism. And Scott, this guy Scott, was British. And what that meant was that, of 
course, previous polar expeditions mostly relied on um, dogs to pull their sleds. So, Babshe, no, Ljudi is pozvali sobački, to bi tjagat ih talješki. But that was not British. What's British? Ponies. Horses. It's true. So Scott decided that he would use, he would not use so many dogs, and instead, mjesto je tva, on izpozval loši, a pony, pony, kaska pony. Pony. Okay, now dogs, of course, are light and they can easily run in the snow. The ponies, it's more difficult. For Amundsen, the Norwegian, who did not have such a fancy suit, for Amundsen, not only did he use dogs, but he also figured out, he also calculated how far each dog would be able to pull provisions before they died. And if a dog died, well, they could eat the dog. Možno sjesti ta sobačka, ktorý umer. I takým obrazom im ne možno tiažiť takoj bolšoj kolistvo dies. Well, it's totally practical. It's a practical. So, Amundsen and Scott have this very famous race. Uh, Amundsen, this was where Scott started from. This is where Amundsen started from. And the, the trip, Amundsen's trip, went very well. They ate some of the dogs, and they all came back. For Scott, the by the time they reached the South Pole on January 11th, 1912, they had no more dogs. They were pulling all their sleds themselves. And then, on the way back, one by one, they started to fall off. Well, um, one of them, um, his name was Oates, got very sick. And there was an evening when they were stuck inside a tent. Outside. And um, this guy Oates, he knew that he was slowing them down. And he said, at the time when there was this big storm, I'm I'm going to go out for a walk, and don't wait for me. So he just wandered out in the snow, of course he died. And in fact, all the British died on their way back to um, their base. And um, at McMurdo Station, which is the main, so this is the main base where most of um, pretty much all the American science that goes on in Antarctica is based at this place, McMurdo Station. And there, there's a, um, there's a little corn, and I don't know how to say corn in Russian either. Maybe somebody knows. A corn, a corn. A corn is a, um, it's a pile of rocks. And um, that's, um, and this is right about, let's see, so that's 
at the Kurgan, and over here is the main base. I'm not that into the picture. Yeah, so this is actually, this is McMurdo Station in Antarctica, and it looks like a dive. I used to say dive, and just because I've dived, uh, there's, there's a word in English, it's a dive. What does not yet know, Nicrasiva e Miesto? So, this is, this is the main base, um, and that Gorgan is over here, and this is actually Scott's hut. This is the actual, at the Nastayashi Dom, at Katorova, um, on Nacholi, a little bit, not on the usual policy. So, in here, oh, and these are, so these are the, um, these are the equivalent of the, uh, of your NGA or Abshijitia, but these are the, the these are the Abshijitia of uh, the McMurdo Station. Um, what else can I say about this place? Uh, there is uh, here is where they have um, uh, yoga classes every morning. True. Um, here is let's see. This is where they have um, let's see. There's a little. America, there's a, there's a church here, a little chapel, um, and every uh, every year, it's not shown here, but every year there's a big supply ship. It's with a corral, it's the Kriyama, the Bedigu. So inside Scott's hut, it's actually preserved. So this is really what it looks like. It's just been preserved here for the last for the last hundred years or so, and you can just walk in um, and take a look around. Uh, and of course, let's see, what, what time what time do you have, Tali? 15 minutes before 15, three. 15 minutes before three. Oh, okay. All right, so to end today, how many of you are familiar with the story of Shackleton? One person. Oh, this is a great story. Um, so, the thing is that, so this is 1912, 1913, Amundsen has reached the South Pole, and there was no other, so what, if you're a polar explorer, what do you do? What is, what is the next thing to conquer? So what Shackleton decided to do was to do something that was even more difficult even more difficult than getting to the South Pole. Because when you go to the South Pole, what you can do is you start here, and then as you go, you put down supplies along the way. So you put supplies here, and here, and here, and that way you can reduce the amount of weight you have to pull so that when you come back, you're not pulling as much weight, you just pick up your supplies along the way. What's harder is to start here and go all the way across the continent without putting down supplies. And that's what Shackleton decided to do. So he gets a he gets an expedition together, and they set sail for Antarctica from South Georgia Island. This is in the, uh, the South Atlantic. And then, before they can actually get to land, their ship, the Endurance, is uh, the ice was very thick that year. And the ice closed in on the ship, and they could not reach the shore. They were about, I don't know how long, but not, not far, maybe 50 miles from the shore. So the ice closed, closed in on them, and now, of course, as, um, as they're getting closed in, there's a lot of pressure on the ship, and little by little, the ship is starting to feel the stress of all this pressure. And, of course, it gets dark, and their ship is crushed. So. Here they are, how many are there? There's like 30 of them. Their ship has been crushed. They're living on 
the ice itself. And of course, they're just eating seals and penguins. But they have no way, nobody knows they're there, of course. And they have no obvious way of communicating with anyone. And again, they have no ship. So what do they do? Well, what they did is they launched, they had little lifeboats. What's, what's the word in Russian? Shlupka. Huh? Shlupka. Shlupka. They have little shlupki. And they launch their lifeboats and they land on a little island which is called Elephant Island. That's good because now they're no longer on the ice. Now they're on solid land. But even still, nobody knows where they are. They have no way of contacting anyone. So they have to somehow take one of their little shlupki and sail about 1,000 kilometers across very, very rough ocean to the place where they started, this South Georgia Island. It's about 1,000 kilometers away. And they only had very primitive navigation equipment. So they have their three little feet, and they here they are. They get in, so there's four of them with Shackleton. They get in one of their little lifeboats, and here are these guys, and they're waving goodbye from Elephant Island as these four guys are somehow going to sail a thousand kilometers to South Georgia Island, then come back and rescue them maybe in one or two years, maybe. And I particularly like this picture because it reminds me of the cover of Magical Mystery Toy by the Beatles. This is a real photo. Sorry? This is a real photo. This is a real photo. So there was a series of photos, there was this guy Frank Hurley, who took all these photos. You can look it up on the web, they're all, they're all in there. So they start, let's see, so here is, let's see, here is where their, um, let's see, yeah, here is where they're stuck in the ice, and then the ice carries them, or the, the, the yeah, the whole ice mass carries them. Over here is where the, the, uh, the ship breaks, and they're close enough here, they launch their little shnooki, and they get to Elephant Island, and now they take one of their little lifeboats, the James Card, and they're heading for South Georgia Island, four of them. Okay, remarkably, remarkably, they arrive in South Georgia Island. The bad news is that they need to be over here, and they've landed on the other side of the island, and there's a big mountain range between them and the base that they need to be at. And it's basically just a big glacier. Nevertheless, in the space of something like 36 hours, yeah, yeah, so 40 kilometers they cover in 36 hours going up uh, something like um, two kilometer, three kilometer of ice in a glacier. And then they make, they, they come back to the place they had started from, they turn around, and, they, they were, and in fact, they actually made it all the way back to Elephant Island and rescued everyone. Nobody died. Amazing. And there's this great quote of Shackleton after this happened. So, of course, he was not able to make this trans-Antarctic trip, but, of course, he had this great adventure. And there's this quote that I'll recite. Um, 
We had pierced the veneer of outside things. We had suffered, starved, and triumphed, groveled down, yet grasped the glory, grown bigger in the bigness of the whole. We had seen God in his splendors, heard the text that nature renders. We had reached the naked soul of man. And his memoir is called South, or published in 1919. You can actually just, just read it. All right, so that's a little inspirational story. If you're not familiar with it, I'd encourage you to... To, uh, to go online and see the pictures because they're actually, they're, they're remarkable. All right, that's enough about history. So tomorrow I'll start with, um, I'll talk about the geophysical features, why it is that Antarctica is such a good place for doing astronomy and astrophysics, and that will bring us into a discussion of the, um, of the CMB a little bit. It's already familiar to you. And after that, we'll talk more about cosmic rays, okay? And if you have questions, please let me know. That's all. Thank you.